right, everybody. We're they're kind of coming in. It's 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 backing off just a little bit. So as as more people begin to come, we're going to allow them to do so. So just scoot on over if there's a seat next to you so they can have a seat. I want to say that it's so good to have you all here today. Is that all right? I am glad that you are here. The whole purpose for having these meetings is so that citizens of this great city have information that they need to make the best decisions that they can. So that's why we're doing this. I wanted to get out of the gate as quick as we could. And each time that there is a meeting, we'll begin to add additional information that comes to be and share with you. Uh, starting next week, I believe, Matt, correct me if I'm not correct, some of the other council members are jumping on board, so they're going to start having meetings. And no meeting is just particularly for one particular district. So if you'd like to attend one of theirs, you can. This one was open to anybody who'd like to come. I just wanted to make sure that we had uh, an opportunity to get out the information as we could. There's nothing like not having information when you need it, huh? So we wanted to make sure that we do it. Hope that everybody signed in in the back. And also, if you stop by, if you feel like you, have, you may have a question and you do not want to stand up or have somebody point you out, you can write your question on one of the uh, three by five cards that are in the back. If you need one, We'll get them to you. If not, you'll have an opportunity as we get through the presentation to ask some questions that you may have, or you may have some questions that someone else has. We just want to make sure that we get your questions answered and get you the information that we need. Did everyone get a handout as well? Yes. All right. If you've been with me before for a meeting, you know how we do. I'm going to ask my sister to come up and give us a quick prayer right quick so we can start this thing all right. Bow your heads, please. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for allowing us to come to the end of our work day. Thank you for each and every person that's gathered here now representing the community and our neighborhood. Father, we thank you for the information that we're about to receive. We ask you now for your wisdom that the eyes of our understanding be enlightened so that we can understand and obtain the information and make the right choices that we may need to make. Thank you for those coming out today and sacrificing their time to provide us with this information. We invite your presence in all that we do and everything that every decision that we have to make in this city is all your glory and your power, and your honor, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 That'll get us going, won't it? All righty. Um, I'm going to introduce some folks who are in the building. They will be helping us to uh, get through this evening and continue on as other council members begin to have meetings as well. We have the infamous Jared Atkinson, who's our city manager, who's done an awesome job for us. Let's please welcome and thank Jared for being here. We've got his sidekick who keeps him in line, and that's Angelica Gonzalez. She is his assistant. In the back, we have Deputy City Manager, Mr. Bill Howerton. Right next to him, I'm going to introduce this crew as one because there's several of them here today. And, man, that, that makes us all feel special. We've got the media crew. We've got one, two, and three. We've got the head lady, Miss Lacey, in the back. So any information that you see that's on Channel 2, any recordings and all that good stuff, these folks are the one to do it. They're here today to record this meeting, and hopefully we'll begin looping it through uh, Channel 2 as well as time begins. We've got some other good folks. We've got Matt Dotre in the back. He's the gentleman that had that big old smile on his face when you walked in. Am I missing anybody else? Oh, oh, we've got some EUB folks. That's right, Miss Petra Gamble. Yeah, she's on our EUB. She bought her own crew tonight. I just want you to know that. But again, we're glad that you are here. I am also go who did I see? I saw someone from LPNL. Who did I see? Uh, Harvey. Harvey, where are you? Where are you? Harvey. Stand up, Harvey. Harvey is the money man at LPNL or the City of Lubbock <laughs> Utilities. 
He's joining us here today. He has good information as well. But the man of the hour who will be providing us and walking us through this information and kind of giving us some samples for us to begin looking at is the main man with the master plan. That's Matt Rose from the City of Lubbock Utilities. Please welcome him here as we get started. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And, and, and just know I can't match that energy. So I will give you information. I'll, I'll walk you through all these things. But I hope I'm exciting as that intro. And I know I'm not. But these are really important. This is the second one of these we've done with Councilmember Patterson Harris. And as she mentioned, we've got several more coming up uh, over the next month. But we're going to continue to have, you know, events like these with council members in their district. But as we get closer in, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that, we're also going to have standalone meetings uh, so that we can bring folks in and not just tell them about what's going on with this project like you're going to hear tonight, but get to a point in time where I can invite all y'all in and really kind of pass a baton and say, these are the folks that are going to be the new providers in Lubbock. Get to know them, go around, meet them, gather information, and ultimately make a decision about who you want to be the provider of your electricity as you go forward. But tonight, it's going to be kind of about the basics. For anybody that's been to one of these before or has heard me talk, you're going to hear me uh, repeat some things I've said before, because that's part of this process, is getting out in front of groups and saying this over and over and over again so that... Everybody that comes to it takes away a little bit of information, but more importantly, you walk out of here with information about, or information that you can share with friends, family members, and folks that may not get to attend. So that's really one of the most important things that you can do leaving here is also be kind of a conduit for folks that you know to get them where they need to be. So before I kind of walk through the basics of this, I really just want to hit on the fact that this has been a project that has been underway really since 2015. You know, when I, when I first got to LPNL in 2013, uh, we had a big change in leadership. We had a wholesale change in the Electric Utility Board, uh, and we had a whole new leadership team that came in. And one of the things that we did at that point in time, because we were at a point where we had to make a big decision about where we were going to go for the next 50 years in terms of how folks here in Lubbock receive their power. And we really had two decisions, or two paths. We could stay doing business as we had been doing it before. We could have stayed in the Southwest Power Pool, and I'll talk a little bit about what these things are as we go through this, but we could have stayed where we were at that point in time. We could have built a very, very large uh, natural gas power plant to supply power to all of our customers. If we had taken that road, uh, that one facility today would be the sole source of where we get our electricity for the city of Lubbock. And all of the ratepayers here in Lubbock would have been the only ones on the hook to pay for that investment. And that investment was going to be about $750 million. So on one hand, folks naturally look at this and say, well, isn't it good to control your own fate in terms of having a power plant that you control? In some aspects, yes, but overall, no because you own that power plant, but you don't have decisions over things like natural gas pricing. And that would be the only fuel source that we'd be subjected to. And once again, our rates would reflect having to take out all of that debt. We decided at that point in time that instead we were gonna pursue joining the ERCOT market, which is the market that serves about 93% of Texas. And that by joining ERCOT, we would not have to build a, a power plant we would build transmission lines, those large lines that ultimately connected us to ERCOT, but that investment that we made would be shared by every single ratepayer in the state of Texas, and in fact, got us into a position today where we shed about $42 million worth of cost that we were paying before that really got us nowhere, and today we've got a brand new revenue stream of $45 million coming in the door that pays for these transmission lines that we've built. So I wanted to start with that basis because a lot of times we get into this conversation and then we'll backtrack for a second because somebody will say, I want to talk about why we went to ERCOT. So I wanted to establish that first. But as we went through that process to join ERCOT, we had to eventually, after many, many studies and looking at this, go before the Public Utility Commission in 2018 to get our approval. And at that point in time, it became obvious to us that one of the things that our customers wanted to see was for us to return to a place where they had a choice in their electric provider. 
You know, here in Lubbock, we had competition for decades. It was a very rare form of competition that we had here in Lubbock and that you had two electric companies that were building lines down each side of the alley and you got to choose which one that you hooked onto. That's really not the way that this is run in nearly any other market across the United States. But in Lubbock, it was unique. Well, in 2010, the city made the decision to purchase those electrical lines from XL Energy. And starting at that point in time, Lubbock became the sole provider of electricity for those in our territory. We are the third largest municipally owned utility in the state of Texas. Uh, San Antonio is by far the largest. Austin is second. We're third. There's 71 other cities in Texas that own their own utility and operate as LPNL does today. There are also 75 electric cooperatives like SPEC that services some part of the city and then going out in the counties. Well, in 1999, within the ERCOT region of Texas, they deregulated a portion of Texas and said that these customers get to go choose who their power provider is. At the time, they said every single area that is served by investor-owned utilities or private companies, y'all have to deregulate and you have to allow your customers to have choice. But the 72 cities and the 75 cooperatives, you guys are not subject to being pushed into competition. But if at any point in time, y'all can join us by a vote of your governing board. And so that's what happened on February 22nd uh, of 2022 is after going through this long period, and I should say the reason I brought up the Public Utility Commission is at that point in time, we laid it on the table and we told everybody across the state of Texas, if you allow our folks to join our cot, we will pursue bringing competition to Lubbock and be the first city that voluntarily opts into competition since it was created in 1999. So that's what gets us today to today, is that the board last February of 2022 made the decision to move forward we have been building towards this behind the scenes in terms of putting together the computer equipment and, and changing the business processes to get to where we are today. But we're now at a point in time where we're going out to the public to say, well, you do not have to do anything tonight. We're within eyeshot of you having to make a decision. So let's talk a little bit about what that means. So very simply, competition, as I say a lot, is, is like comparing uh, and shopping for cell phones or internet plans. There's a variety of different plans that can meet your need, and that's what competition brings. Customers can shop for retail electric providers and plans that bit, best fit their needs, and right now that's slated to come forward this fall. Once we make this, once we make this move, and the schedule right now as it stands is that starting on August 2nd, we will open up a shopping window where our customers can go out to the powertochoose.org website, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a second, but you can go out there on August 2nd, and you can shop plans, and you can sign up with who will be your new provider. And then, again, according to the schedule, we will get to a point at the, at the 1st of September where we'll close down that shopping window, and there will be a short period of time where we make sure that everybody's connected where they need to be, and starting in October, when you would naturally receive your City of Lubbock Utilities bill, you will receive your very last bill for Lubbock Power and Light. And starting in uh, uh, November, you will receive your first bill from whoever you chose as your provider. So at that point in time that we make that transition, LPNL will be the delivery system for the electricity that you choose from your provider. We will continue to own and maintain all the poles and wires that we do today. You know, right now, Lubbock Power and Light, acting through the city of Lubbock, is the owner of all of the electrical grid that we service. And it's our responsibility to invest in that. Just like the last few days when we've had outages, our linemen go out and fix those outages. All of that is going to remain the same. Uh, we will be on call during outages, as I mentioned. Luckily, now we've got advanced meters or smart meters in the field, so if you have an outage, you don't have to call us. We automatically know you're out, and we send a crew out, but we'll still be responsible for that. And as you sign up with your providers or as you switch providers, start new service, transfer, it'll still be our responsibility to make those switches because ultimately the meters are still going to be owned and operated by Lubbock Power & Light along with the wires. 
What we will not do, what we will not be in the business of, is buying and selling electricity for our customers. We will be out of that business completely. Um, we will not be an option for you to choose when you choose your new provider. We will not send you bills directly. You're going to continue to get your City of Lubbock Utilities bill as you do today that has your water, your wastewater, stormwater, and solid waste on it. Those four departments of the city are going to operate just like they do today outside of LPNL's control, but they'll still be on your City of Lubbock Utilities bill. But LPNL will exit that bill, and when you pick your new provider company A, B, or C, our charges for maintaining the infrastructure here and delivering electricity will be included in your provider's bill, just like it is in Dallas today. If you're in Dallas in the competitive market and you go choose a provider, whichever provider you choose does not right then and there send a construction crew out and build a line to your house. They operate on the highways that already exist. And there's a company called Encore who owns and maintains those facilities, and their charges for doing that show up on your bill. We'll be the exact same. We'll be that line item on your bill, and our, our costs are looking to be exactly the same uh, over the long term as Centerpoint, AEP, Encore, Texas, and New Mexico Power. Those are the entities that do this job around the state. We're going to be substantially smaller than them because we just own our grid here at home, but that's also indicative of the fact that we're the first city to do this, so we are continuing to break ground. So right now, it's not necessarily shown on your bill like this. If you look on your City of Lubbock Utilities bill, you'll see a pie chart like this, but that pie chart's breaking up your electric, your water, and your different services. But if you're actually to break down your rate, your electric rate as it is today, it would look like this. The light blue section here, where it says transmission and delivery, that is listed on your bill as, as, as the energy charge or the base charge. That piece right there is 30% of your bill. That 30% has been locked since 2017 because if you'll remember, we had to, I know I remember it because I talked to a lot of groups like this. Starting in 2014, if you'll remember, we had to go through five years of gradual rate increases to pay for the infrastructure programs that we've gone through. All of that long-term debt, all that investment in our capital, about $500 million, all of what it takes for us to pay our employees, buy trucks, maintain our lines, all of that is contained there. The dark blue that says purchase power, that's what it costs us to make or buy power. And we buy the vast majority of the power that we provide to our customers. That is a straight pass-through. We don't make a penny either way on that. We simply go out and say, we need this much electricity for every single day of this summer. And that is purchased. And then we take that and we spread it across our entire customer base. And that's what we base off of what we charge each and every customer for us to be whole on the power that we brought for our, our customers. When we make this move, that orange section, that is now what is in, in y'all's domain. That is what you are deciding. We're still going to be that light blue. We're still going to make investments in the grid, maintain reliability, deliver the product that you choose. But for that orange section, that's where you're going to go on to the PowerToChoose.org website, or you're going to go to our website, or you know the shopping guide when we can list out the reps on there and call up. That's who. You, that's what you're hiring. You're going out and saying, company A, B, or C. I like the power product that you're providing. I like what it costs, I like how it looks. That's, I wanna buy from you. And once you make that decision and you sign that contract, then we're the ones that deliver that product to your home. And so the next step as we've talked about um, is that we need to move the remaining customers over to the ERCOT grid. Right now, 70% of our customers and I could look across this crowd and say 70% of this crowd is hooked up to the ERCOT grid. 30% is still hooked up to the Southwest Power Pool grid. I guarantee you that you don't know which one you're hooked up to because we priced it exactly the same. We've maintained both grids. But we need to take that grid, that 30%, and connect it to the larger grid, and therefore everybody will now be hooked into ERCOT. We said at the very beginning of this, because this is such a big and consequential move, that we would not do this until 100% of customers were in ERCOT. Because it's the only fair and equitable way for us to make this transition. 
if we had decided in Memorial Day of 2021 when we did the first step and moved 70% of our customers over, if at that time we had said, you know what, we're going to offer customers choice that are in ERCOT, which we could have done, it would have been an absolute mess because I'd be walking around this crowd saying, you've got competition and you don't. And you do and you don't. You do, you know, all the way through because of where your house or apartment or business was arbitrarily hooked up to. I shouldn't say arbitrarily. I mean, a decision was made in 2010, but you might have bought that house in 2017 or moved into that apartment in 2017. And it was, so, you know, right? So we have to get everybody across the line. So we just got approval from the Public Utility Commission to do that. We have one more step of approvals that should be this next week. And once that's approved, I'll be out in front of everybody in May saying, hey, we got to remove, move the remaining customers over. And we'll have a lookup tool on our website that you can type in your meter number, which is located on your bill, and it'll tell you if you're affected in the second move and when you're affected. But right now, we're looking at the end of May, 1st of June, to flip everybody over that hasn't been yet. And it will be very much like that procedure in May of 2021 in that there will be a short outage as we unplug you from one section and plug you into the other. But I'll be talking a lot in the news about you know, what that's going to look like here in about three weeks as we get towards that move. But, you know, again, we went through this in 21 without any sort of ordeal, and that's what we're really shooting for this second time. But once we get everybody in, that really starts kind of the countdown of going to competition. I mentioned earlier, when we get to August, when we get to that shopping window that we discussed where you can go pick your own provider, what we are going to do is that we are going to have a series of events, likely at the Civic Center. That's what we're looking at right now, probably maybe over a series of Saturdays. And we're going to shout out to all of our customers, y'all come up here and meet these new providers. Every single one of these providers that's going to be operating in this market, I'm going to sit there and tell them, you need to come up here and take a free booth space and bring everything you need to sign customers up. This is your opportunity to come win folks over. And I think we'll get a good crowd, but it'll allow y'all to come up there and not just get information, but act on it. One of the things I wanted to do is I wanted to kind of break it up so we have a lot of these types of sessions about general knowledge, but I didn't want folks to come out on a particular night thinking they're going to sign up with somebody only to be sent home and say, come back in two weeks. So that's why we're waiting to bring all of those reps in when they can actually do something, and that'll be during that shopping window. I'll promote that, but you have to imagine that all these folks that want to win your business will be spending a lot of money advertising it as well. So I have to think that everybody's going to be aware of it, but that's, that's, that's our task. So right now, if you go to our website, that front page that's on our website, it's been locked for about a year. It'll be locked through the end of this project. There is a section on retail competition that's underneath Powering Lubbock, but more easily just go to the Read More button on the homepage, click that, and it will take you to the competition section that we've been adding to over the past months. Right here I talked about, this is just kind of our general journey that we've been on. So as you can see, we're nearing the end of this. We've got some pretty important things that we need to get taken care of. Uh, but you can see that we've moved through this on time and it's our intention to do so going forward. One thing that, that was probably the last big achievement that we got through, but is probably one of the most important ones, is that the Electric Utility Board and the City Council approved safety net providers. So I want to talk for a second about what that means. When you go to competition, you must designate who is going to be what they call your provider of last resort? Meaning that if a particular company goes out of business, those customers of that company automatically get shifted to the provider of last resort so that the lights don't go out. And then from there, you can go pick a new provider. But if you've picked a company that for whatever reason goes out of business, your lights don't go out one night or one day and you're just stuck sitting there going, what happened? but there's a notification process through the Public Utility Commission, and you'll be switched to another provider, and then from there you can figure out where you need to go. But to make this a successful project, I'm gonna go talk to everybody I can, but you have to imagine when August comes and that, and that decision comes, not everybody's gonna go pick. 
either because they didn't know what was going on, they did not have the wherewithal to get it done, they're not tech savvy, they don't have computer equipment and the internet at their house, right? Any number of reasons why somebody might not be able to go out and choose. So along with choosing a provider of last resort, which is reliant, by the way, we also chose three default providers, and this will be a one-time designation. Those three default providers are Reliant, TXU Energy, and Octopus Energy. I was not really aware of who Octopus Energy was when they went through this process. I do now, and I've, I've been very encouraged by what I've seen from their company. But to get there, they had to go through a pretty rigorous vetting process, public bid process. We had a special committee look at this, and one of the things we did is we didn't just look at reliability and affordability, but we also put a value on that bid of what type of a community support utility have you been? What have you done in other markets to show that you're not just there to charge people, but you're also there to kind of make that community better? So that was a key component. And what within your offerings help folks that are lower income? And so that, those were two very important things we looked at. But those three entities, when we get to this point that we choose, if you have not chosen a provider, during that September time period, after everybody's chosen or not, you will be randomly assigned one of those three utilities. And you'll be put on a month-by-month -month contract, but at any point in time, day one or day 90, you can go pick somebody else. But they are required to give you rates that are the average rates in the market. Meaning, so if somebody doesn't choose, they're going to land somewhere and they're going to get rates that are right there with what everybody else had so that nobody falls through the crack. That was an important thing that we had to make sure of because we don't want anybody sitting out there who has not chosen in the dark. So that will be the process once we get to September. Also on our website, we've started putting out these short animated videos. We've got two more that we're about to publish, but all of these videos that we publish are going to be a series of instructional videos that you can follow that teach you about competition and how to shop. So the first ones we had were really, what is retail competition? What do we look like after that? We'll delve into kind of rates and how that's structured and what you need to ask in terms of looking for a new provider. But those are, those are good resources. They're in English and Spanish, and I encourage everybody to go take a look at them. And if you've got folks that you think could benefit, please send it to them. Also on our, our webpage, we've got a front section, but we've got an information for customers section that has shopping updates, key events and dates, uh, and account services. This has not been updated to show it, but... This presentation that you're watching tonight is on our website that you can download. The little one-pager handout is on there. And this little bit longer kind of retail electric competition shopping guide is on there. This is going to be a really, really important document to try to get in everybody's hands as we go through this. All of the information that's housed in this document today, we've taken strictly from the Public Utility Commission's website. And, we, and we're going to start adding our own information on there. One of the key pieces of information that's not included in this booklet that you need to know about is who are those retail electric providers going to be? It's the question I get with most of these groups. Who are these companies? How many are they going to be? And what do they look like? We don't know just yet. We are about to, starting here this month, go through testing with all the companies that have signed up to serve. They have to complete testing with us to make sure their product corresponds with ours. And they have to prove that they are registered to do business with the Public Utility Commission and here in Lubbock. So we will complete that really within the next few weeks. And we will have our list of providers that will be here in Lubbock. And we will put that list up on our website. Their name, their number, uh, their contact number, and their website so that if you don't want to go to the PowerToChoose.org website to make your decision, the state website, you can go on that list and just call any of these folks. And we'll have the, the number on there that gets you to where you need to be to talk to them about signing up for service. 
I'm doing this one so that you all can go out there and look at these companies and get a good idea of who's going to be in the market, but also so that as we go through this, if somebody comes and knocks on your door or somebody calls you on the phone, you can go take a look at this list and see if you see their company on that list. And if they're not on that list, you know this is not a reputable entity that I need to discuss. Really important, there are already people that watch the news that are going door to door talking to people. There is no one who is registered and authorized to sign you up today. So if they come by your house and they say, hey, I want to sign you up. We're doing business in Lubbock. Let me see your bill. Don't do it. Tell them that that time's not come yet, that you know that that time's not come yet, and that you're not going to share any personal information with them. I'm not sure if they're scammers or they're just getting ahead of the game, but it's always best to assume they're scammers. I've gotten a little cynical in this job. I'll be honest with you. So my first, my first go-to always is this person is trying to, trying to take advantage of somebody. But y'all need to know that. Nobody's authorized to sign you up just yet. We've got frequently asked questions that are really based off of these kind of talks that we've been having. So I'm sure that when we get to Q&A here in a second, I'll pick up some more that we'll take home and put on this. But read through those uh, frequently asked questions. It's a good resource. Now, importantly, the power to choose.org website. I suggest that everybody go to lpndell.com. We've got in various different places buttons that you can push to get you to this website. But there are lots of variations of this website. If you go out and you type in powertochoose.com, it brings you up to a sponsored website by a retail electric provider that's trying to skew you in their favor. So that's why I say just go to our website and click on these. It's easier. You know you're in the right place. But if you go there individually, it's powertochoose.org. It's the Texas-sanctioned website. It's run by the Public Utility Commission. Everything on here that you see is legitimate. So this is how you use this website when it comes time. And I think the one pager that I gave you has the step-by-step -step instructions. So this is the front page of the website. The first thing that you will do is you will enter your zip code. So, like, say, say here for Lubbock, you type in, I don't know, 79401. Once you, once you do that, you will click on View Results, and it's probably going to ask you, like, these three questions. Do you know, how, on average, how much electricity you use a month? Most people don't. So that's where you would go to your electric bill and you would look at or go online and you'd look at your historical usage. You don't have to do this, but the reason it's asking you this is it can tailor a plan more specific to your needs. If you do know what you've used on a monthly basis over 12 months, if you know you're somebody that uses 1,500 kilowatt hours in the summertime but only 300 kilowatt hours in the wintertime, there may be retail electric providers that have a plan that suit that. Or if you know that you're constant, same thing. They can help tailor that to you. This really isn't a question anymore, do you want a fixed rate or a variable rate, but I would say to everybody in this room, fixed rate. Fixed rate. A lot of the stories that you heard after Winter Storm Uri, folks in Dallas getting eight, $9,000 bills. In the competitive market, you used to be able to sign up for variable rates that allows you to go shop basically for your own wholesale power. But I'm guaranteeing everybody in this room, including myself, is not qualified to do that. Harvey is, as our CFO. He does that every day. But you know what? He's got an entire financial team and has outside consultants that every single day they get on the phone and they analyze the price of power on that given day. And not only do they buy power for Lubbock, but they hedge that power. They do all sorts of complicated things that I have no idea what they're doing. But it gives us insurance. Those folks that picked variable rates, when winter storm hit, URI hit, and the price in the market went way up, they rode that escalator all the way to the top. Folks that had fixed rates, they weren't bothered by that. So. The legislature has outlawed most of these variable rate plans for everybody other than those sophisticated enough like a Texas Tech or something like that to go do. But just know, fixed rate always. But number three is important. How, how long do you want your contract to last? 
I've told groups that you may not be sure of what you're doing when you first make your decision. You have the option to pick a three-month plan or a six-month plan if you want to see, you know what, I'm going to test this company out and see how it goes. Or you may be somebody that you say, I like the price of this, of this plan. I'm going to lock it in for 60 months. And typically, the longer contract you're willing to sign will get you a little bit better price with that company just because you're locking it in longer. As most things that you do, that type of consistency will, will pay off in your rate. Now, this is interesting. So, I don't know if this is the best way to put it, but I've been saying this quite a bit. One of the nice things about public power, one of the nice things about a municipally owned utility like Lubbock Power and Light that operates how we have been operating is that we are consistent in terms of our rates and pricing. One of the downsides is that we are consistent. And this is what I mean by that. The price of natural gas goes up and down every single day and certainly over seasons. In 2019, and, and the price of natural gas primarily drives what you pay for electricity because it is the primary fuel source that makes electricity, especially here in Texas. In 2019, Lubbock Power and Light was paying that summer of 2019 on average about 90 cents for natural gas. 2020, it went to $1.86 for natural gas. The next year, it was $2.86. This last summer, we were paying $7, some days up to 9 And so when I remember when I showed you that pie chart and I said, this is what it costs us to make power when we pass that through to our customers? We set that on October 1st and June 1st of every single year based off of what we have seen in our actual costs and what is projected to be over the next, you know, six months or so. When we got to October, we had been paying 7 to $9 for natural gas. And when we consulted the, the federal agencies that chart this and all the consultants, they said, we think the price of natural gas is going to stay about $5. And so that's where we set that rate. Well, it's been a very warm winter. And so natural gas prices have fallen. And our rates have stayed the same. I'm going to give you a little bit of a preview, and I apologize to the EUB member that I'm getting ahead of her, but our discussion tomorrow at the EUB meeting is going to be what we're going to do with that pass-through rate in our final summer being in the market because it's going to come down because our co realized costs have been down, and we pass that back to our customers. But the market reacts faster. So all of this that you see on the page here, that's from Midland. I've been suggesting to people that if you want to start playing around with the power to choose our website, go type in a zip code from a neighboring city that has had competition for the past 20 years. Midland, Odessa, San Angelo, Wichita Falls, Abilene, Dallas, or Houston. But I suggest doing Midland because that's always a pretty good representative of what we will see here in Lubbock. If you type Midland zip code in today, where LPNL's rate is you know, above 15 cents all in, you can get a 7.7 .7 cent plan in Midland because they've already accounted for that lower natural gas. So that's where I say you can get a lot better pricing in the competitive market as it, as it fluctuates and as it looks to be as we're entering into this market. We're going to put up in big bold letters or big bold um, numbers on our website when it comes time to choose exactly what our all-in rate is for our customers all electric and those that heat with natural gas because they're slightly different. But we're going to list those out there and I'm going to tell everybody this is the price to beat. Take our cost, let's say at that time it's 13 cents all in or 12 cents all in and go to the PowerToChoose.org website and try to beat it. Right now you could certainly beat it. Now on the left side of the page you're going to see that there are filters. So as you go through, you can choose these filters, and it's going to change the pricing in those plans. And let's see if I've got this so that it illustrates it. So let's see here. Fixed rate. I'm going to skip forward here. Okay. I want to start here. Let's say that you are somebody 
who has never called City of Lubbock Utilities about your LPNL electric bill. That you're somebody that says, I've really not interacted with customer service, I don't need to. Then company rating may not matter to you. Remember, we're going to be the ones delivering the power. So you're still going to, you know, talk to us about the reliability aspects of things. But in terms of cost and your pricing and all of that, if you're somebody that says, I don't really care about that, then you may be somebody that says, I'll just take that 7.7 .7 cent per kilowatt hour rate and I'm good. But let's say you say, I do care about that. So I only want four and five star rated companies. So you click that. I want four and five star rated companies because I talk to my electric customer service person a lot and I want to have that option. Let's say you are somebody, and I'm not saying anybody here is, but there are some out there for sure that say, I care about my impact on the environment. I care about my carbon footprint. So I only want my power to come from 100% renewable energy. Well, you can click that, and you can click the percentage. So let's say you go all the way up to 100, right? The, if you do that, when you click four- and five-star rated companies, it's going to reset, and you're going to see that all of a sudden, maybe the lowest plan there is nine cents because you've only picked kind of the top, top, top echelon company, and you're paying for that customer service premium. When you click, I want 100% renewable energy, now you're probably going to see that your lowest cost plan is going to come in at 11 or 12 cents because you're getting real specific in terms of what you want to buy. You know, we have folks all the time that say, I really care, and I'm going I'm to pick on green energy some more, that say, I really care about this. I wish the city of Lubbock would go out there and only buy green power. The problem right now is that we have to take into account every single one of our customers' wants and needs. So we can't get real specific and say, you know what, we're going to make a philosophical stand and go all green. Because you may have a whole section of your customer base that say, I don't care about that. Why am I paying for that premium? Or vice versa. Now, each individual customer gets to decide. So if it matters to you, then you can layer that into what you want your electric product to be. And the price is going to reflect that. But what I'm trying to illustrate is that you do drive and do have control over what your product looks like and what it costs. Now, in all of this, when it comes time and you say, I like company A, I like their price, I've gone through the filters, I've gotten it to where I want it to be, this is exactly who I want to do business with. You're going to see that they've got a fact sheet. Each one is required to have a fact sheet. And each one is required to look like this and have the same information on there. This is important. Before you sign up for plans, read this. The legislature and the PUC mandated that this section is not fine print like updating some software or you know, downloading an app where it's a million pages and you don't know what's in there. This has to be clear. It has to be up front. It all has to be the same. But it's going to tell you what this company you signed up for, what their policies are, but more importantly, what their fees are. What is the deposit? I get asked this a lot, and so I'll just answer it right now. When we make this transition, there will be a deposit more than likely that will be required by each and every one of these electric providers, just like every electric provider out there in the world today. If I moved to Austin, ended my service with Lubbock Power and Light, but now I'm in Austin, another municipal utility, and I signed up with Austin Energy, Austin Energy would require me to sign up for a deposit. We're making this transition, so that's going to be a part of this process. But LPNL is also required to provide each of you with a letter of credit so that if you've got a good pay history, you can get that deposit reduced or eliminated altogether. But even if not, there are energy assistant agencies in the city of Lubbock that will help with things like electric deposits. And so we'll have them listed on our page as well. And we're actually doing a whole meet and greet with reps tomorrow that are looking to be in this market with the energy assistance agencies so we can put them in the same room together. They can start working on this because this will be a rough part of this transition is that folks that may not have paid a deposit in a while may have to this time. If you have a deposit with Lubbock Power and Light on file, 
you'll receive that back when you get that final bill in October from us, as long as you don't walk your bill. If you do, that's the exact reason why people have deposits, so that everybody else in the system doesn't pay for the person that walks. But if you final service and you have a deposit on file, you'll get that back. But for most customers, you know, we automatically refund deposits after 12 months of good pay. Something you want to look on here, does your new provider do that or do you have to ask them about it? If I get disconnected, what's my reconnect fee, right? There's all sorts of things that you want to know about. So make sure that you read that because it is important. Just to point out on the Power to Choose website, there's a user's guide. Y'all don't need that today because it's included, it's included in this and in your handout. But that user's guide is a step-by-step, -step, but we've stolen that and put it on our website, so you don't need to bother with that. Just come to lpnl.com. We've got that information. <laughs> and again, that's the user's guide that we've got, that we've got up there. Also, obviously, if you can, follow us on our social media. Follow us on, on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter. Um, just this weekend and past week, we've had some, some various outages. I'm always posting, you know, outage information through social media. But as it comes to this, we'll continue posting updates on social media. So please do follow us if you can. But before we transition over and take questions, one thing, I, one thing I want to say real quick is that when this gets built out into its final form, which I hope we're there in about 45 to 60 days, and that we can include all of the retail electric providers that are operating here, and we'll know who they are because testing is only done periodically. And so when we go through this first run of testing and these folks are registered, they'll be, they'll be the ones that y'all will be offered when we get in August. When we get to the fall and later on, there may be new folks that show up, but we know they can't do that without testing and registering. So those names, those contact things will be in here. Key dates will be in here. We'll add even more personal information. But when we get to that point, I'm looking for all sorts of places to put these. And so like one area that we've, that we've looked at and we're gonna do is putting this in all the libraries. So I can go out and tell people, if you do not have internet access, you don't have the ability to do this at your house, go to your local library and you can pick up one of these packets. You can use their computers if you want to, but you have access to it. I'll have stacks of them at the City of Lubbock Utilities Customer Service Center downtown. I've been talking to various different churches about putting it in their informational uh, bulletin board areas. But anybody in this room that has an area that would be good to drop this kind of stuff off, let myself know, let the council member know. There's various different ways to do that, but we want to try to get these in hard copy out there as many paces as we, as we possibly can. But also utilize y'all in terms of getting this out to folks. So I will stop there and we will go to questions because this is always the most exciting bit. I think you're making an assumption. Every generation is different. This generation may be computer savvy, but there may be some senior citizens who may not own a laptop. Is there going to be some help for those individuals, especially in, in senior citizens where they live by themselves? Is there going to be some somewhere where they can someone can help them? So, and then the, and then the second question I have: My understanding is that you're going to get out of the utility business, but what about the water and, and garbage? Is that going to be a separate bill? So we're going to get two bills? Sure. One for electricity and one for garbage and water? Sure. So I'll take the second part first. Okay. As I was saying a little while ago, city of LPNL does not do water, wastewater, solid waste, or stormwater. We are solely the electric provider for the city of Lubbock. Water and wastewater runs through the water department, stormwater through the stormwater department, solid waste through the solid waste department. Those are all contained on your city of Lubbock utilities bill. You will, you will get your City of Lubbock utility bill as you do today. Going forward, nothing will change. Only difference is Lubbock Power and Light will not be on that bill. Our charges for maintaining the infrastructure will be on the bill of the provider you choose. And so nothing will change in terms of your other utility services. Those will still be run by those other departments outside of us, and still you'll still go to the same website, call the same number, 775 for those. 
in terms of your first question, that's what I was that's what I was just going through, which is we understand that not everybody has a computer at home. That's why we want to get this information in places like libraries that folks can go and use those resources. We want these we want these informational packets to be comprehensive enough that folks can read through them and discern where they need to go. The challenge with this is that our folks, when you call the customer service call center, our folks cannot choose for you. We cannot cross that line legally. And so that's why I really, really, really want to emphasize the shopping fairs that we will have in that shopping window at the Civic Center because that generation and those folks that don't have access to this and don't know can come someplace and talk to real people and go station by station. And, and when it comes time for us to do that, I'm going to make up little flyers that say these are the 10 or the 5 questions that you need to ask at each booth. Go through these 10 questions and see which ones you value the most. And as you go to company A, B, and C, ask them those questions and kind of put them through the paces. Uh, another area that we're going to make sure that we get everything translated into English and Spanish because we know that that is going to be a challenge for folks that, that do not necessarily speak English. So we want to make sure that they've got those resources as well. We don't have one tonight, but going forward, we're going to look to bring somebody from the customer service center who is fluent in Spanish to events like this so that they can help. I wish that I could sit here and talk to you in Spanish, but I would just insult you. So I'm not going to do that. But we want to have somebody there that can so that folks in the audience that, that need that assistance can get that. This is really about trying to get this information out to as many people as we possibly can in as kind of a basic and standard process as we can. Because overall, this is a big concept. But when it comes time to choosing, it can be as simple as point and click. But we want to make sure that people don't get locked into something that they don't want. Or that they can't afford. So, but, that, but that's also why I really, really, really want to shout for the rooftops. This is what you pay today with LPNL. Here's your rate. Your rate is 13.8 cents per kilowatt hour go make sure that whatever you choose is underneath that number. Because I talk to groups all the time, and I can talk rate all the time. The average person, they don't talk rate, they talk bill. I pay 175, 275, 375, right? Not, I pay 14.8 cents per kilowatt hour. So that's why we've got to laymanize it and say, go beat this actual dollar amount. And, 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 and give folks that type of a challenge. Yes. Yes. Uh, I just had some clarifying questions. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of the individuals that I help, my mom and other people, they like to physically go to the office. So once they choose these plans, that won't be possible anymore. There will not be a physical office with these plans here in Lubbock. That's a good question. And, and I will tell you right now that at least one of the new providers does have a physical office here in Lubbock. And I think that's important to look at when you go through this process, is it goes back to how much do I value particular aspects of customer service? So just like you would go on the website and say, I'm somebody that interacts a lot, so I only want four and five star rated companies. I think that's a question that needs to be asked at that shopping fair or otherwise is, do you have a physical presence in Lubbock? If I have a question, can I come talk to somebody? And it's likely going to be the bigger, the bigger electric um, reps that will have that. But I think for some folks, it's a really valuable thing. And I've gotten that question a lot. So thank you for bringing that up because it, it, it's going to be a decision factor with some folks. Okay, thank you. And mm -hmm. You, there's a date range when the windows open to choose these companies. You said August the second, second. Mm -hmm. to when? So it'll be August. It'll it'll be it'll. Right now we're looking at about five or six weeks. Uh, but I will have firm locked in dates for you before too long. I know that August second is our is our date to meet, and we've got a couple other things that we've got to get through. But uh, it should be four to uh, five to six weeks that it's open. Okay, 
Yeah, I, yeah, I have more questions. Sorry. Oh, yeah, no. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I know that there's a deposit that's going to be required, mm -hmm. and the meter's going to still be owned by, I'll just still call it LPNL. Yes, you're right. Yes. Okay, so will there, if once they choose which electrical plan, like, they don't have to come in and, like, change in the meter. The meter's going to stay. No. Meter, so... I will actually, we've had a couple of instances the last week where this has come up. So I'll go ahead and use this opportunity to say the point of separation between what the customer owns and what Lubbock Power and Light owns is the meter. The meter box that it connects to is a part of your house and something that you own or your apartment complex owns or your business owns. The meter that we stick on there is, belongs to us, and all the wires that go out from that uh, belong to us. So, just like today, on a monthly basis, you pay a set $8.07, you'll still pay that, and we'll still be the ones that maintain that meter. And one of the things we're building right now, and getting a little in the weeds, but just so you know kind of what we're putting together is, in order to make this work, we basically have to build a computer system so that all of those reads that are taken on a daily basis from your electric meter, because right now with your meter, it's sending read information, you know, on a, on a, on a fairly regular basis throughout the day. All of that information is going to be housed in a place so that when you choose that rep, they get access to your information. So all of that will be automated, but the physical meter will still be owned by us. Okay, mm -hmm. and I know that you're going to have, I'm sorry if everyone has questions, I'm sorry. No, these are all great <laughs> questions. So yeah. I know that you're going to have like open um, shopping. Mm -hmm. it, so will you have, I know that you want to have the information in libraries, but a lot of individuals don't go to libraries. They do go to the grocery store. So if you have like a poster to announce when they, these things will be available at the grocery store, if that's possible. I'm, I'm, here's the thing. I hope that it's possible because it's something I'm working on. I haven't, I, I haven't found out exactly since obviously these entities are private and they get to decide who litters their sidewalks. But um, I would like to have all of this information uh, in the various grocery stores because to your point, Right now, we're trying to find locations where, where are people logically going to go anyways, right. and let's catch them there. And so if, grocery stores are, are on our list for sure. And if you can also do it at schools as well, because a lot of parents, grandparents, guardians go to the schools to pick up their kids. Okay. Um, and, you know, loved ones, that could be another um, resource to use. Yes. Yes. No, that, that's, that's a good idea, and we've got a good relationship with LISD, and I'll, I will, I'll reach out to them. I've been working the grocery store angle, but the schools is a really good idea, and so let me see, let me see if, I can, if, if we can do that, because that's a good idea. Okay. I'm going to piggyback right with her, just for the simple fact that I do work with LISD, mm -hmm. and I know after doing our yearly survey, a lot of our grandparents were not able to fill out the because we're doing the QR code now, we're trying to switch from paper to QR. And not to pat myself on the back, but last year, our count just for surveys that we heard parents from grandparents was over from 500 to 300 and something surveys that I physically put myself to put into the computer for them mm -hmm. because they did not have access to computers and stuff. Yeah. But I felt they needed to be heard through our survey, so I took the advantage of putting it in for them. So when we're talking about like this gentleman over here that said, we don't have computers, we don't know mm -hmm. about computers and stuff. We're can, you know, I feel like there should be centers throughout the city for them to be able to go right. or call so they can call so they can get some kind of assistance. Yeah, and yeah. See, but, see, but see, that goes back to I'm trying to find places where we can put this information out there, but just like our call center or our customer service center today, if somebody goes in, we can have somebody give them all this information. That person cannot help them select a provider. And so if I, if, to your point, and I get where you're going, can we have kind of substations here? Where we, 
that's what we're trying to do in terms of finding places to distribute this, but we're still going to have the same problem of one of our employees can't sit there and help them choose. So that's always going to be a challenge. You know, what's interesting is you talk about the surveys. We, we watch on a, and I'm not going to cite the exact numbers because it's changed, but I will tell you, we monitor on a monthly basis how customers pay their city of Lubbock utilities bill. And that guides a lot of times, you know, how we reach out to customers. And we still have, despite the fact that we've made a really big push to get people to pay online through the kiosks or other ways, we still have a sizable portion of this population that comes in every month and brings a check. And that goes back to the point of that needs to be a value that you put into your, your equation if you're somebody that wants to do that, wants to go physically and pay your bill or physically ask a question. Um, and I, and I'm, I'm going to kind of emphasize that tomorrow coming out of here because that to me is one of the, one of the more important things that, that we've heard thus far is you know, trying to get that taken care of. But yeah, there are going to be folks that, that, that want to go see somebody in person, no question, because they do today. Oh, yes, sir. Sorry, ma'am. Just one second. Hi, yes, uh, you touched on it briefly, and I just kind of wanted to bring it up again because for some of us, this whole process is kind of new to us, mm -hmm. like to even have this decision to pick something. And you did kind of go into a little bit like the renewable energies and things of that nature. But, I mean, what are some of the biggest differences between competing companies that we should even consider? Because like some of myself, I've never been faced with this decision. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't even know, like what should I even be considering other than price? I mean, I don't know if you could any, if you had any more, uh, I guess, details on that matter. Ab absolutely. And that, and that goes to um, what we've got up today and what we're going to continue to build out to your point of kind of that, oh, calling trees kind of a bad example, but it's kind of that, you know, these are the things that I value. So as I go through this here, the questions that I need to ask, you know, the big differences are going to be the larger utilities, are going to have more products, right? So if you watch a Texas Rangers game, uh, you notice that there's advertising all the time from TXU in Dallas about free nights and weekends, right? You're, with the bigger entities, you're going to be able to find those types of plans, those types of products. I'm not always the biggest fan of free nights and weekends unless it you have a schedule that really adheres to that. Sounds great, but in the hours that you are paying, your rate's going to be higher, substantially higher to make up for the free nights and weekends. But that's the difference you're going to get is that with the larger entities, you're going to have more variation of your rate. With the smaller entities, it's going to be more of a bare bones. This is your cost and this is your contract length. We don't have all the bells and whistles. And so for some, like for myself personally, I'm probably going to be somewhere in between. I'm probably going to focus on locking something in at a good price so it's consistent all the way through. But you may have people that say, I really want to, to have something outside the box. It hasn't been mentioned, but I will mention solar panels because that's a good example. You know, right now, we've got about 15, 1,600 homes in Lubbock that have solar panels. We have had a net metering program for solar panels since 2015, which is a dollar to dollar match. Whatever your panel produces, it takes off of you know, what you consume and you net it out. But we've never had a buyback program. If you're one of these 15 or 1600 customers that have solar panels on your home, you're gonna wanna specifically look for a provider that has the best buyback program. So if your panels overproduce, you know, you're getting the greatest benefit from it. And so it's a, it's a little bit broad in answering your question, but that's really what it is. The bigger entities are gonna give you more. Let me put it this way too. I'm judging this off of the surrounding communities, but if our market looks like theirs, San Angelo, Midland, Wichita Falls, we're gonna have about 30 companies that are gonna offer about 120 to 150 different plans. And when I say that, a lot of times, folks will kind of draw back and say, that sounds really but again, I go back to you can make this as complex or as simple as you want to make it. And those 120 to 150 pans allow people to get complex, where some people may just say, I want the lowest price for the longest time, lock it in, I'm done.
Right. No, yeah. I understand so. that. And uh, I guess my, um, and that greatly answers my question. So I appreciate that. But mm -hmm. uh, it was just, I guess, so are we going to have to reach out to these companies? Like once they become known, are we going to have to reach out if we have like questions in specific? So you will have, be? yeah, you will have to do something, right? You're right. That's the thing about this. This is that everybody's going to have to do something for some folks. They're going to spend 20 minutes and they're going to power to choose.org. They're going to type in their zip code. They're going to scan down. I like this one and I'm done. Other folks are going to be more complex about it, but that's why we want to put their, their contact numbers, emails on the website, because there's going to be some folks that might even do a two tiered approach where they go research it on power to choose.org and say, okay, these are my favorite three companies and my favorite three plans. And then they call those companies and say, tell me a little bit more about yourself. And right. so that's, that'll be the option that you'll have of different points of contact. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yes, ma'am. LPNL will still, uh, so the question was about meter rates and LPNL owning the meter. And so again, we'll still own the meter and we'll own all the lines that connect to it, uh, running into it. And today, for that meter maintenance and customer service and the lines that are running in, you pay a set $8.07 every month. You'll continue to do that going forward. Okay. Yes, Is that passed on to the company that we choose? No, that's, that's, that, that's, okay. that's, that's, that's covering our costs of maintaining those wires and those meters and the, and the employees that, that service those. Yes, How will we be built in that? So it'll be on your new provider's bill. So let's, let's say that you pick company A and you get your bill from company A. Like any electric bill, you've got your line items going down. There will be a line item on there that says um, transmission distribution utility, or it will say electric delivery company. And that will be that blue section. So just like it is today, just like it is today for what we own and, the, and, and delivering the product that we buy for you to your home, same thing now except you're buying your product from somebody else as you've agreed to and we're just delivering it, but that blue stays the same. So I've seen this a lot, I've heard this a lot on social media and other places in commentary where they'll say, Ugh, you know, LPNL said that they were leaving. They said they were going away. Come to find out, they're just sneaking their charges on our new bill. <laughs> I get it. I promise you, I get it. But I'm also here telling you, that's the way this works. The electricity's got to be delivered by somebody, and it's always going to be one entity. And the idea here, and I'll kind of say this to more of a global perspective, is that today, we only own this grid and we only maintain this grid here in Lubbock. Other areas of the state like Dallas, where Encore, say, owns it, they have 3.5 million customers kind of sprawling all over the place, and they look across north and going out west Texas and decide, we're gonna repair this section of grid, that section of grid. As long as we maintain this structure here today, y'all will go pick who you want your electric provider to be. And our sole job will be to maintain the grid we own here today, with the council looking over our shoulder, making sure every year on the EEB's recommendation that we're putting the right amount of investment into the grid to maintain reliability. Yes, sir. Yes. Hello, how are you doing? Uh, good evening. My, uh, I have, um, if you don't mind, two questions, one personal, mm -hmm. one more commercial. Uh, the personal one, I haven't heard much about it, is how all this kind of affects apartment complexes. And I ask that question mm -hmm. because I do monitor my bill, and I've seen less usage, and my bill doesn't change. So uh, that, that's my first question as far as how, how, does, it, how does it affect um, apartment complexes? And then the, uh, the commercial question is, uh, outside of the, the commercialized answer of uh, people not choosing a provider, you had mentioned, I believe, that this is uh, something that's been been in the in the work since uh, I think it's at 05, I believe? Uh, 2015. 2015, okay. So I assume there's been tons of research in, in, into this move. What pitfalls have uh, LPNL uh, foreseen to the community um, 
hmm? with this move? So I'll, I'll start, once again, I'll start with the second and then go to the first. The pitfall is confusion. Confusion and a new level of complexity that a lot of folks here in Lubbock have never experienced. Because for, mo for some folks, you know, they got to adulthood in the teens, right? And we've always been the sole provider and they've just always gone with what our rate has been. For other folks, you know, pre-2010, they were used to having an A, B decision. And so they like competition, but this is a larger version of what we had here previously. And so the biggest pitfall has just been communication, education, and getting out in front of folks. And, and that's why this, is, this has been kind of a long, steady process and now is ramping up. We, the default or the safety net providers was an important step in this because we know everybody's going to land with the provider. And we know everybody has choice. And so it was the best way to try to mitigate that risk. But there is still going to be the risk of somebody picking a plan they don't like. But they always, always, always have the option of breaking that plan if they do not like it. But that's why it's important to read the electricity facts label, that fact sheet that I told you about, because a lot of these companies will say, if you quit us before your contract's up, the penalty is $200. Another company may say it's $1,000. But that's why if you're unsure, you need to check, if I don't like this company or I don't like this rate, I have the ability to break it, but I know exactly what it's going to take to do so. So on one hand, there's folks that say, I don't like the fact that LPNL is just designated as our only provider, and whatever they say the cost of electricity is, that's the cost of electricity. And I don't like it, and I'm stuck with it. Other folks say, you know, I, I like that security, I understand both sides of it, but this allows us to get to a place where we can make this transition, folks can choose, and they can have the kind of the freedom of doing that going forward, and we can focus on what really, really matters in terms of delivering that electricity. But through this process, we're gonna continue to be out there talking to folks because they need to know kind of what the rights are. In terms of apartment complexes, how do you how do you receive your bill today? Do you receive it from the apartment complex or do you receive it straight through city, city levy utilities? Okay, so if you receive, if you're an apartment and you receive a bill directly from City of Lubbock Utilities, then that means that you have a meter specifically for your unit and you individually have signed up for service. There are some apartment complexes that only have one meter and they just split it equally amongst their tenants. In that scenario, your apartment complex is going to choose what provider you have and pass that on to you. If you're somebody who is in an all bills paid, where your electricity is paid through your rent, same sort of thing. They're going to choose the provider. But if you get a City of Lubbock Utilities bill today with LPNL on it, that means that when we make this switch, you'll get to decide what, what person you go with because today you have an individual account with us. That's kind of the best way I can answer it because apartment complexes are going to be different depending on how they've built their apartment complex and how the management company runs it. The mall is a really good example, right? There's 150, you know, so on some odd meters at the mall. I guarantee you when we make this, they're not going to let Dippin' Dots choose their own provider, right? I guarantee you through their contract, they're going to say, hey, you know, let us go out there, investigate this, do, and then we'll come back to our tenants with that cost. I imagine a lot of apartments will operate in that fashion, especially if that's how they do it today. So, cool. Yes. Okay. So um, I don't want to get too much in the weeds here, but I, I got a question, and you mentioned earlier in your conversation with the meters. I'm sure we can all agree Lubbock's the best city in, in, the, in the Northwest, right? <laughs> At least in the country, maybe. So with the money that we're obviously collecting or, you know, not having to pay that big chunk anymore, um, what kind of IT are you going to upgrade? Are you, you know, are we going to get mm. better at, you know, what we're doing? Storms are always very scary. Um, you know, I can, I can tell, you know, obviously our IT people um, need an upgrade in, in LPNL. Can you, can you kind of answer that for us? Not to get too much in the weeds. I just, 
So thought that would help. You no, know, absolutely. Um, Can we pinpoint? Are you saying the IT people who di who work with the City of Lubbock Utilities? Yes. yes. Yeah. He mentioned IT. the meters. Oh. Yeah, he mentioned the meters are going to sure. have automatic. It's, we know you don't have to call. So. Oh sure. It's 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 in two pieces because uh, to the council members' uh, question, we utilize the City of Lubbock's IT department, right? For for all of the kind of business that we do. However, the technology that we put in the field is technology that LPNL employees and that our uh, subject matter experts run. What I will tell you is, since I've, so I've been here exactly 10 years, and we have done the amount of projects that a utility would normally do over 30 to 40 years in 10 years, and it's no exaggeration. We went from dial-up meters with technology that was out of date in 1990 all the way to advanced meters in one fell swoop. We built 160 miles of transmission lines. We built three new substations and renovated 12 other ones. I'm not, I'm not just belaboring the point, but to say one of the issues that we've got right now is that we've done so much stuff over a short period of time that we need to get to version 2.0 on all of these different things but we haven't been able to get to it because we're just trying to get through this last piece of this major project. So the next steps in this, and we've got to do this in such a way that we're not out there borrowing more money or raising your rates arbitrarily, is to take those advanced meters and now say, okay, let's take those and it's technology that, that it provides and let's put in a better system to proactively tell you that your lights are out. You know, South Plains Electric Cooperative has, has a version of the meters that we do. They've got a text and call function associated with them. We need to get there. We just haven't been able to. And so those are the types of things that we've got to improve upon is further automating these processes. We need to go back, for example, the outage map we focus right now on let's make sure the outage map works correctly and displays correctly. But the next version of this is let's try to get down to more granular detail so when we have an outage, people know more about what's going on, right? And those are the things that we'll be able to do once we get into 2024. And one thing I'll say here, and this is getting way into the weeds, but you mentioned costs, and I think it's important for everybody to see this. Every single area of the state that has competition today entered into that competitive market in 2002. And when they entered that competitive market, those entities that had previously served as the vertically integrated company, right, like we are, that serves them on all levels, had to end that business. And there was costs associated with that. So the first two or three years of the competitive market in Texas, the costs were reflected and then those costs came down, and then over the past 20 years, they have systematically built up the machinery that they use to serve customers in the competitive market. We're ending our business and standing up all of this all at once. And so we have a carrying on cost. One of those costs is that we had one contract remaining that we had to resolve before we could remove, move the rest of our customers over. It was a $500 million contract that we negotiated down to about $77 million, and we're gonna amortize that over a long period of time to minimize the impact. But when you look at 24 and 25, those years, we're still carrying some of those costs, and then they fall off. And so when I say that our rates are gonna be the same as the others, they are the same, but we've got that transfer charge and that stranded cost. So I wanna be transparent with y'all that in the first two years of this market, We've got to pay off the remaining bit of that debt so we can be free and clear. And at that point, not only can we lower our cost, but having that extra $45 million a year coming in from those transmission lines lets us cash fund more projects like you're talking about and quicker. But technology is going to be the next phase of what LPNL does once we get through this process. But I'm glad you brought that up because it's important for folks to know that. Yes, sir. So, sorry. So, Didn't mean to jump you. Sorry. One quick, one quick question. I don't need a mic. Uh, you know, change is, is uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. 
transition sometimes is scary. With that being said, um, you mentioned you mentioned earlier about LPNL's responsibility would be pretty much for the infrastructure, power line, mm -hmm. et cetera. I'm sorry. Uh, with that being said, we live in a society where people are skeptical mm -hmm. about change. Um, there's going to be a lot of questions that are going to come about with regards to this transitioning to ERCOT and uh, utilizing new service providers. Mm -hmm. I can just imagine a large sales forces barraging the neighborhoods, canvassing the neighborhoods, trying to sell their product. Mm -hmm. So what if, if, it, if at all possible, and I don't know if this is LPNL's responsibility or have you all considered so that the citizens could be informed of putting together a safety net or a safeguard for unethical practice, practices with regards to individuals coming in and making lofty promises and just to get your business. And then once you mm -hmm. subscribe to their services, it's a whole different ballgame. Mm -hmm. and, and the second part of my question is, <clears throat> You mentioned that every a person has the right to choose a service provider. If you're not satisfied with that service provider, will that service provider have a right to lock you lock you in for a period of time, or uh, or you have to pay a buyout mm -hmm. to to change service, or is it kind of almost like open enrollment for insurance? Well, you once you lock in, you're locked in for a year. Right. No, it's no, it's it's great. It's a great question, and you know, like we were talking about. I always stress reading reading the key facts, reading the key facts before you sign up. That's what you want to look at, right? You want to look at if I break this contract, what is it going to cost me? Is it going to cost me 50 bucks, 200 bucks, $500? Like they have to list what their term they can't they cannot legally lock you in. But they can tell you that if you break this contract, this will be the exact amount of money that you will be charged to break this contract. And so that's why it's important that you look at that because that's a key, you know, if you get in there and you just absolutely cannot stand this company or they didn't deliver, you've got a recourse to get out of it. Now, the Public Utility Commission is, is the one that receives customer complaints in the competitive market. And we'll have on our, on our website how to contact them by, by email or phone to lodge complaints about these providers. And we, and we would hope that folks would do that, and the PUC is very reactive to it. There's another state agency called the Office of Public Utility Council whose sole job it is to, is to protect ratepayers, but they really do so more on a, on a higher level at the Public Utility Commission. Direct complaints go to the PUC. Um, and, and, oh, and the first part was, you know, bad actors, you know, folks coming by trying to sell you. So I stressed earlier, if somebody comes to your door and says they could sign you up today, they, they're not telling the truth. They're, they, they can't do that right now. And that's why I want to put all of the registered reps on our website. So if somebody comes by and cold calls you, you know if they're reputable or not. And here's the thing. If somebody comes and knocks on your door, they are legally required to have a peddler's permit per the city. And, and we've had two instances just in the past two weeks where we've had folks call and say, I've had somebody bang on my door and, and, and ask for my bill. And they even took a card and we've turned that over to PD and we've turned it over to the city for them to investigate going after that individual for not being registered to go door to door. And that's important. But I, I will continue to work on basically kind of the customer bill of rights to put on our website to, to include more information about that because all of this is not just about comfort and security at the end of the day as much as we can achieve that, but it's also public safety. And including a public safety is not having somebody scam you or steal your, steal your information. So thank you for that. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty loud, but uh, <laughs> I just got one simple question. I know you're sitting here saying about all the availability of these other companies. Will people still be able to stay with LPNL if they choose to? No, they will not. No. No. Okay. Yeah. Simple question. No, hey, look, I, I, I can't say that enough because, look, the, I, I get it all the time when I talk to groups. I'll walk through this, and they will say, 
this sounds fun, exciting, and whatever else, but we'll just stay with you guys. Like, I promise you, promise you, promise you, you know, can't do that. But, but thank you for that, because I can't say that enough. Because I don't, you know, I don't want people to get lulled into a false sense of security and not pay attention to this. You know? It's like I say, this can be as simple as you want to make it, but you got to know about it first, and you got to pay attention to it first. So let's just keep driving that home. You know, you're going to have to choose somebody. For sure. Yes. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I just have one question. So with all these changes changes happening right around the corner, how soon will LPNL uh, refund the uh, security deposits to the customers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so as we're talking about, a lot of customers have had their deposit returned because we have an automatic, you're automatically refunded your deposit after 12 months straight of good pay. But if you have a deposit on file, when you get your final LPNL bill on your City Lubbock Utilities bill in October, um, we have to give everybody's deposits back at that point in time. So we can't keep anybody's deposit after we exit this business. That has to all be zeroed out. Yes, sir. Thank you. No, nope. if you've got any level of a deposit on file, after we final out your account, you will receive every penny of that back. But here's, here's something I'll throw out there that's just, I, I worked at the comptroller's office before I, I came to LPNL, and I like saying this because it's fun. Go to the comptroller's unclaimed property website and type your name in there. You probably have money in, in that, and you don't realize it. And that includes deposits that you've paid to utilities over the years that you might have forgotten about and not receive back, or an insurance refund check. So I'll just plug the comptrollers and say, go check that out, because you may have some cash. I wanted to ask about the bad actors we spoke of in reference to those who are already, you know, canvassing neighborhoods and knocking on people's doors, you know, without the peddler's permit and all. Is there a way, would LPNL be willing to maybe have a list of bad actors on their website, or at least have a, a place for us to go to know who's out there so that we can at least be almost like a neighborhood watch, be aware of who is not being honest in sure. our community. So I, I'm, I'm going to say this cautiously because I don't want to get Jenny in trouble. Jen, Jenny, is our, Jenny is our general counsel, um, and, and, and we have our, our electric utility board member here. Um, and so I don't want to get Jenny in trouble, but she also keeps us out of trouble. I've asked about that, and there are ways that we can do that, but we do have to be careful that we're not kind of stepping over the line and subjecting somebody to saying that we're defaming them or doing something like that. So the way that I think that we can run this is when somebody, if somebody you know or you yourself has somebody come by your house that it seems to be a bad actor, Call City Lubbock Utilities and let them know. We've asked them to report up every single call that they get about this type of thing so we can investigate it. And what we can do, if it's investigated and they're not acting properly, is we can put information out to the public. And depending on what it is that they're doing, we may be able to tell them who this player is that's not acting properly. But from my end, I, I would love to put their face up there. I would love to put everything I could up there because it drives me crazy, the people that do this. So we will do it in some version. I just don't know how mean I can be about it, but we'll see. Because, again, the folks that are doing this need to be called out. Well, maybe just to post the phone number of the entity that you mentioned, yeah. maybe just on the main mm -hmm. uh, website so we know who to contact, even if you don't okay. list a bad actor. Just yeah. you know, provide a way for the community to be able to know what entity to call and who to report to, even if it also is the Lubbock Police Department, if they need to then do their investigation. Yeah. So I'll, I'll couple it with, with kind of what you suggested, and I, I think what we can probably do is I think we can probably come up with kind of your, these are your rights, and this is what, you know, you, you're not supposed to be subjected to. Include in there where they can call or where they can report it and what their remedies are. And then we can probably start a communication chain out there on a regular basis about know your rights. So I'll couple that with that. 
and we can probably put a product together that I can do that okay. for sure. It's just I don't know if I can say Bert's Electric Shop is scamming people. Right, right. That might get me fired. Not so, but other people can. <laughs> so, uh, I've liked that question. <laughs> the money that I have paid into the into the light company. Oh. Uh, and ahead of time, do I get any of that money back or do that money go to another company that I have paid my money? You know, because I pay, I get credit, and I just want to know how do that credit go, the money that I know pay and ahead of time before my, you know, with my light bill. Do I, yeah, you know, do no, it to absolutely. another company? Yeah, no, it's same, same, same as the deposits. Any dollar, any penny that you have in your account when we close you out will get sent back to you. So if you've overpaid, it's the same thing as a deposit. We, we're not allowed to keep any of y'all's money that doesn't go to a bill owed. I have a question that was sent up to me in writing, and it, it says, if LPNL sells its product at zero markup, how can those new providers do the same? The second question is, will our costs go up because they have to make a profit? <laughs> so, yeah, look if, if it's, look, if it's a private company, then, then they do have a right to a rate of return. They just do. But that's what you're looking at in terms of, you know, I showed you Midland right now that their costs are substantially lower. What we do know about a lot of these entities is that these entities are extremely large utilities that have very, very large and broad buying power. And so it allows them to buy power in a larger volume at a lower cost than even LPNL does. They also have a lot of experts that are in there every single day hedging and doing the things that they need to keep, to keep their prices down. We know that they can react quicker to costs going down in the market because we've seen that in real time the last six months. We know that they can do that. Um, but the difference is, in most cases is just the volume by which they can buy the power. And it gives them a lot of leverage to buy it at a lower cost. Why they're not recommending about solar panels? Repeat that again. Sorry. Okay. So I I'm going I'm gonna I'm gonna take this I'm gonna take this kind of outside of this conversation a little bit to say. Solar panels are a decision that you make like any other modification to your home. Solar panels are not going to make you money, right? And solar panels, in a lot of instances, are not going to forever do away with your electric bill. They're just not. And one of the things that, that you have to understand about solar panels is that you see all the time where they say, they're free. They are not free. They are not free. And what ends up happening is that these folks go door to door and they tell people, if you sign up, they're free. You don't have to pay anything today. The number of people that we have seen come in that at the blink of an eye have financed thirty and $40,000 worth of solar panels. When was the last time that some stranger came to your home and said, buy this car for $40,000? And you're like, done. Right? But they enter into these contracts. And what ends up happening is, yes, the solar panels produce. And they reduce your bill. 75%, maybe in high performing months, maybe they cover your entire bill. But you know what you're also paying? You're also paying 150 to 200 bucks a month for the finance charge. So what are you really saving? Now, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna go off on a whole rant here and say that solar panels are terrible. They're not. The people that decide to put solar panels on their home, it helps the rest of the grid. It helps us globally. If you look at an entity like ERCOT, whose responsibility it is, to make sure that we've got 83,000 you know, megawatts of power at any point in time in Texas to cover our really hot summers, they want everybody to put solar panels out there because it reduces the amount of, of demand on the system. 
But I always just want to be really clear and say, solar panels are a substantial personal investment that you need to research all the way through. And so our stance has always been, we love it if you put solar panels on there just so long as you don't get trapped in the solar panel contracts. But now that we're going to the market, those with solar panels, they probably will have some better negotiating power with their rep. And it probably will benefit them. So there are good sides to it. But that's, that's kind of my five-minute rant about solar panels. <laughs> yes. Well, you'll, you'll have a bill from your new provider that operates within ERCOT. So, so ERCOT is, so like right now, we are hooked onto the Southwest Power Pool. Or we've been hooked onto the Southwest Power Pool, right? The Southwest Power Pool is the power grid that runs basically from Lubbock all the way up through Canada, right? ERCOT is the power grid within Texas, and so we have disconnected from one grid and joined the other. ERCOT's not a provider of power. ERCOT's basically the air traffic controller. They control the grid, and on any given day, they say, we need this amount of power on the grid. So all of you 600 power plants around the state of Texas you need to put that amount of power on the grid. And then once they get those commitments, ERCOT says, this is what the wholesale pricing in that market's going to be. And so in terms of ERCOT, you know, your provider that you choose is doing business within the ERCOT grid. And that's who you'll get to and say, hey, I got a panel on my home. What do you buy back my power for if I overproduce? And there may be some that, that offer a pretty, good, a pretty good substantial buyback. Whatever provider we choose, are y'all going to provide the pay history that we had with LPNL? We are. We are, and, and I will just tell you, uh, everybody's going to get a letter from me in the mail here pretty quick. And what it's going to say is that as we make this transition, we need to provide our customers' data to ERCOT and to these reps so they can sign y'all up. When somebody gets something in the mail saying that you're going to give your, they're going to give your information away, we know they just see red and they're going to call us and say, how dare you? But ERCOT is going to be the custodian of that information. So when you go to sign up with that rep, they're immediately given access to your information so they can sign you up. They've got your bill, they've got your usage history in there. What it's going to be is it's going to be your name and your, the name of the account holder, the address of the account holder, and what your usage history has been over a period of time. And that's what allows them to look at your usage history and match you with a plan more accurately. I'm also down in Austin trying to get a pill passed, again, for this very same reason, because it wasn't ever, invention, it wasn't ever really intended in, in a lot of people's minds that somebody would actually do this. And we're a city that says, all right, we're going to join these other cities and do it. So I'm actually having to get some laws changed in Austin to make sure that we can migrate that customer data like they do for those 9 million Texans that are currently in the competitive market. Can you turn your mic on so that they, these gentlemen can hear it? It's on. So I The, the, easy, the easiest way to answer that just is, do you personally receive an electric bill today? Um, no, sir. It's through our uh, portal app. On okay. Well, then likely, likely location rentals would be the entity that would pick the provider. It's, it, it's interesting that you mention that because I've talked a lot about apartments. You know, I've talked a lot about... Uh, you know, dorms at Texas Tech, right? Like Texas, Texas Tech, for example, has hired an energy broker and they're going to pick their, their own provider. And that provider is going to provide power to the dorms, right? Uh, I talk about apartments. Yours is actually the first, I've not heard that before, that a rental company that your electric, your utilities go through them. So I actually need to research that a little bit. But really, if, yeah, if you don't receive a bill today, and they pay your bill, then I would think it would be there. But I need, I actually need to research that more because that's a new one. I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, well, they have the bills in their name. And so we don't put it in our names, but they just send us, okay, how much our water is due, like all that, all the bill, and parcel. 
Yeah. I mean, I, I'm not. I'm not with them. I mean, I would for for them. I would probably release that and let the customers pick themselves because I think it'd be kind of a headache. But if that's the way they have it structured today, it's likely that's the structure after. Um, but that's a new one that I need to research more. And I and I wasn't able to go because I was talking to another group. But we actually spoke to the property managers group this week of which location rentals is one so i'll get back with the folks that talk to them add that into the mix because i really don't know that's a good question any other questions well before you make a mad dash to the door i just want to say again thank you for being here Thanking you for uh, what I would ask that you do. If you have someone in your life that may be a part of the aging population, the information that you have gathered for yourself and that you will use for yourself, that you work with them and also help them in making this move as well. Before you leave, I just want to advise you of some additional meetings that will take place. If you have some additional questions and want to attend or you know some other citizens that would like to attend. On May the 1st, we'll be at Lubbock Christian University. Districts uh, 6 and 3 will be hosting that at 5.30. On May the 8th, District 1 will be hosting it at 5.30 at the Maggie Trejo Center. And on oh, five, May 15th, at Cooper West, Districts 4 and 5 will host that one at 5.30. So please feel free to share with folks that you know. Again, the information that you've gathered, if you would please share it with someone else. If someone else would like to attend another meeting to gather the information, please share this. This should also be on our website as well so that people can know that information. What we want, and what I'll, talk, I'll say for Sheila, what I want is for citizens to have the information that they need, and if they have questions, to be able to ask those and get answers to those questions. So again, I want to say thank you guys for coming. Those of you, if this is your first time coming to the two, we welcome you, and you can come back and see us again. This is the best district on this side of heaven, if nobody's ever told you that. Thank you guys so much. <laughs>